Good evening. Welcome to Living Sustainably, the concluding lecture in our series, How the Humanities Can Save the Planet, delivered by Sir Jonathan Bate and sponsored by uh, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Department of English, uh, the Global Institute of Sustainability, and the Institute for Humanities Research. I'm Mark Lucher, prof professor of English and senior sustainability scholar at GEOS, and at the moment, acting director of the Environmental Humanities Initiative. The initiative only came into being in 2015 with the last appearance at ASU of Professor Bate. And across the expanse of its existence, the EHI has created an undergraduate environmental humanities certificate, held conferences and workshops, made connections that stretch across the world, and emerged as a leading program in the increasingly important field of ecological and environmental studies. A collective effort uh, uh, that so many of you in the room this evening have to which you've contributed. I want to acknowledge those who helped support Professor Bates' sabbatical residency at ASU for what we would term Spring A, January and February. Given that John, Jonathan and I are team teaching environmental film literature and theory through the Department of English, our exemplary chair, Krista Ratcliffe, not only approved the course, but offered important monetary support that came at a crucial moment. During her service as Interim Dean of Humanities, Elizabeth Langland immediately offered the resources and support of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and has continued that support as the Director of the Institute for Humanities Research. Such support tends to begin at the top, and Patrick Kinney, uh, known to many of you, our Dean of CLAS, provided encouragement and offered his support, and this program and, so, and for this program and so much more. Without the enthusiastic support of Gary Dirks, I know you're here, Gary, uh, I'm not gonna introduce you tonight, you'll be happy to know, uh, director of the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability, and my closest working partner on the minute particulars of uh, Professor Bates' residency at ASU, these magical two months would not have been possible. Deep thanks to all of you. It's an honor to know and work with you. Of course, one other individual, our new Dean of Humanities, Jeffrey Cohn, simply volunteered his support for this and other initiatives within the emerging area of applied humanities and placed such concerns at the core of his vision for our evolving disciplinary future. When we explore uh, Jeffrey's work in areas in the area of environmental humanities, medieval studies, or posthumanism, such a commitment comes clearly into view through vibrant research and crystalline writing. His groundbreaking work across the last 20 years, plus 20 years, uh, has helped define and then revolutionize the fields of ecocriticism, environmental studies, medieval studies, and posthumanism. And his publication and media work reveal a restless, ranging intellect, beginning with the vastly influential collection Monster Theory, 1996, and extending to his award winning medieval studies group blog, In the Middle, which has attracted a paltry three million views since, it, uh, since its inception. Whenever Jeffrey turns his eye and his mind to a subject, he passes along the wonder of discovery, to paraphrase his foreword to the recent collection, Material Echocriticism. Most recently, such wonder animated his truly extraordinary 2015 book, Stone, An Ecology of the Inhuman, which won the Rene, Relic, uh, Rene Wellick Prize for Comparative Literature in 2017. Uh, that's the highest recognition in the field. As well, the importance of his scholarship resides in his willingness to help bring forward uh, the work of others. With three such uh, compilations highlighting the range and versatility of the disciplines within which he works and the generosity that stands behind such editorial efforts. Veer Ecology, a companion for environmental thinking, 2018. Elemental Echocriticism, thinking with earth, air, water, and fire, 2015, and prismatic ecology, echo theory beyond green, in 2013. 
Like most, in, like most introductions, this brief evocation of his work has merely skimmed the surface. Although one form of the awe of wonder might be uh, how he found time and the ability to maintain such relentless productivity while providing leadership for the universities wherein he labored and the profession he so ably served. Please help me welcome Professor Jeffrey Cohn, who will introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Thank you, Mark. That was so very generous. And I'm really happy to be here tonight, and also sad that we've arrived at number three. Um, I wish we could go on and on. So I'm Jeffrey Cohen. I'm the Dean of Humanities here at ISU. I'm also an environmental humanist. I'm especially interested in materiality, the elements, and their agency. As someone who works in an archive from previous centuries, in fact, centuries upon centuries old, for both those reasons, it's an especial honor to be able to introduce Sir Jonathan Bate, who does many of these same things, but with an aplomb that I can only envy. Now, I know many of you have been at these events already, and I won't rehearse the very long list of achievements that Sir Jonathan Bate has so rightfully earned over his life, but I'll simply remind you that he's many things. An award-winning scholar of Shakespeare, an award-winning environmental humanist, an award-winning biographer, a playwright, the man from Stratford, 2010, a groundbreaking critic who was knighted in 2015 for services to literary scholarship and higher education. I think if that ever happened to me, I would just die. What is there beyond that? A capable administrator, provost of Worcester College and professor of English literature at the University of Oxford, a public intellectual who has traveled the world expounding the value of literary study, a documentarian, a script writer, and an ardent and tireless advocate for the humanities. Sir Jonathan Bate, in other words, strikes me as someone who can be wholly at home in a place like this at ASU, a place where so capacious an ambit is still extraordinary, but also woven into our culture. Honestly, Professor Bates' work and his achievements takes us back in a good way to the Renaissance, where interdisciplinarity was simply what people did, and restless, field-crossing curiosity of the kind that he so amply displays was a way of life. We're gathered here tonight for the culminating lecture in a three-part series. Living sustainably is the injunction that we need now. I think about this possibility a lot now that I live in a desert city that ought not to even be here, a desert that calls us to think big thoughts and materialize exorbitant dreams. And maybe when we can be a little more attentive to the actual present and past of this place, to recognize that it was sustainably inhabited long before colonists arrived from the west, from the east. When dreaming up a rationale for an initiative called the Desert Humanities, so look for news on that soon, our faculty working group decided the desert is the future, and that seems right. It seems like in that desert, in this place of the future, is uh, the perfect place to host this lecture tonight. The environmental humanities that we practice here at ASU is welcoming. We take the university's access mission seriously. It is diverse. We want the field to reflect the students we teach, and it is public. Knowledge that we lock away is knowledge too easily lost. And finally, it strives to sustain in the many senses of that multivalent word. Tonight's lecture will contribute to the wide body of work that Sir Jonathan Bate has published within Ecocriticism, from Romantic Ecology to the Song of Earth. But these concerns are everywhere evident throughout his copious works, whether addressed to the study of Shakespeare, or John Clare, or Ted Hughes. It's my pleasure to introduce him for the third of his compelling lectures here at ASU. Please join me in welcoming Sir Jonathan Bate. Well, thank you, Jeffrey, for, I think, 
the most eloquent and generous introduction I have ever had. Thank you. And I would like to uh, join Mark in thanking everybody who's made this wonderful two-month residency possible. I'm so sorry I have brought English cold and rain with me, but put it down to climate change, not to me. And thanks, of course, to Mark Lucier himself, the mastermind of the visit. I'm just going to begin with a little bit of a recap of where I've been in the first two lectures. I know uh, familiar faces in the audience, and thanks for coming back, thanks for staying with it, but some new faces as well. Um, so I began by asking some questions about the origin of our environmental crisis. And I began uh, with this alarming graph, the trajectory of the Anthropocene, the Great Acceleration, showing the way that in so many different areas, ranging from the domestication of land and the loss of tropical forest to levels of ozone, of methane, of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere, to uh, the, uh, the, the acidification of the oceans, the loss of coral reefs, so many different areas, there has been this extraordinary, alarming change. And I noted that, of course, so much of it began with the invention of the steam engine in my country in the late 18th century, and how so quickly, in those first years of the Industrial Revolution, men and women of great foresight began to see that human society was changed forever by mass industrialization and urbanization, but also that the planet, the climate, was beginning to change. Much of my work has really stemmed from that, that moment of revolution and from the romantic and Victorian response to those changes. But of course, the acceleration has been so great since 1945. I've then tried to suggest throughout these lectures that sustainability needs not only the scientists who provide us with empirically evidenced explanation of where we are, of what is happening to our planet. It not only needs technologies, the engineers who will provide innovations and seek to fix the problems that we have created for ourselves. And of course, it needs social scientists who will develop economic models, offer political arguments for change, will seek to influence governments, intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, corporations, local administrations, businesses. But in addition to those disciplines where sustainability has traditionally focused itself, I've argued throughout this series of lectures that the discipline also needs the humanities. Because the humanities offer us narratives on a human scale of time and place. And they offer us an emotional and a personalized engagement with issues of sustainability. They provide scale and they provide a sense of personalization, of empathy, of involvement. Geological time and planetary scale are so hard, not only for lay people to comprehend, but also make it hard for us to think, what can we as individuals do? In my first two lectures, um, I explored narratives of imagined past and imagined futures. I began with the kind of Arcadian idea. You'll recall those of you who've been to the first two lectures, I've used Thomas Cole's remarkable series of paintings on the rise and fall of empire, the progress of empire, beginning from a, a pastoral idyll of uh, a, an imagined past where humankind is at one with nature, through to images of the growth of cities, but then with civilization comes war, comes hostility, comes destruction, and then on through to a sense of ruin, uh, uh, a, a world in which nature has taken back and humankind is no more. Narratives of imagined past and an imagined future. In the last lecture, I spoke of <coughs> end times, apocalyptic images, images of the end of the world. This final lecture will ask what the humanities can provide in helping us to live sustainably now. So we've had the past, we've got the fearful future, what about now? And I want to suggest in a very simple way that the humanities are crucial in four respects. 
communication, imagination, limitation, and deliberation. The humanities have their origin in ancient Greece, in those moments where scholars, thinkers, philosophers, most famously Socrates, bring young people together, young men, of course, it was in classical antiquity, in order to explore the nature of the good life, to explore what it means to be human, what it means to be mortal, what it means to be a social animal. From that ancient idea of the Platonic Academy, the university emerges in the Middle Ages. And for centuries, the function of the university is to educate the people, and they are all men for many, many centuries, who will shape society through the church, through government, through service to the state. The classics of Greece and Rome were, of course, the core of a university education, absolutely, for, for centuries and centuries, even through to the origins of the university, uh, of, of the American university. Um, the purpose of a classical education was to create good citizens, to create thinkers, and to create communicators. At the center of a university education for many, many centuries has been the art of rhetoric, the persuasive use of words in order to influence people, to make people change their minds. That was a training for the church, a training for the law, a training for government. And the humanities today still play a key role in that art of rhetoric, of persuasive speech, clear, critical thinking. ASU has pioneered the idea of sustainability as an academic discipline. But any discipline is dependent on those basic skills of rhetoric, of the use of language. And in that sense, even as enrollments in the major in English literature decline alarmingly, the role of an English department will remain central in a university because of that initial path of teaching the arts of rhetoric, of communication, of clear thinking, of good writing. Our greatest hope for the future is, of course, our young people. And I think we saw this rather remarkably last week with the global school children's strike for a safe climate future. I'm not sure such a thing has ever happened before in the history of the world. It is, of course, thanks to the social media and to the internet that it's possible that at, on one and the same day, from Australia to the UK and in many, many different other countries, school children went on strike, went out on the streets, and protested that their governments should take climate change more seriously. Education, our hope for the future. Another key aspect of what the humanities can offer with that art of rhetoric, of the teaching of clear thinking and communication, is good journalism and good popular science. Those of you who were at my first lecture will remember that I began with Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, published in 1961 and widely regarded as the foundation text of the modern environmental movement. And we showed how, in the first chapter of that book, she offered not scientific data about pesticides, which was her main theme. You remember the harmful effect of DDT and other pesticides is what she was writing about. But she began with what she called a fable, a fable for tomorrow. She began with a story, she began with a narrative, and she could write. She was a great writer as well as a scientist and a journalist. And it seems to me in our world of fake news, quality journalism and good science communication are absolutely crucial. I've had 
an enormous privilege these past two months in having a rest from my administrative duties as a provost. And it's enabled me not only to prepare these lectures and to co-teach a, a course uh, with, with, with Mark Lucia, but it's also just enabled me, me to read more widely um, than I have the chance to in my, in, in my day job. And there have been many recent books that have really impressed me. And this one, Elizabeth Colbert's The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History, which won the Pulitzer Prize a couple of years ago, is a good example of that. Really good science communication. That is only possible if underpinned by the skills that the humanities can teach. But of course, compared with the time of Rachel Carson, where her book sold half a million copies within six months and inspired a CBS documentary and eventually led to changes in government policy and indirectly to the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency, compared with that time, of course, now the number of people who actually read books from cover to cover have diminished and the internet has become the primary medium for communication. But of course, the problem with the internet, as many commentators have pointed out, is that unlike traditional publishing, where there is a very powerful editorial process, there is peer review, there is book reviewing, the internet is a free-for-all. And it seems to me finding ways in which people can be helped to sort the fake news from the real news is, again, a crucial critical skill that the humanities can offer. Um, I particularly, uh, in the matter of uh, climate change, would draw your attention to the Real Climate, uh, realclimate.org uh, website, uh, an exemplary website written by, by climate scientists, but mediated through the literary arts of clear expression. I've also suggested that the power of images is a crucial part of our story. Um, this, a famous photograph um, of uh, a lone polar bear um, on a fragment of an iceberg. In many ways, that single image more powerfully conjures up what is happening with the collapse of the ice sheets of Ar the Arctic, Greenland, and the Antarctic captures it more fully than data possibly can. And you remember I suggested in an earlier lecture that that wonderful Apollo 8 photograph of the Earth from space was, again, a key element in creating a new environmental consciousness. We need to continue to produce great photographers. The composition of the photograph is so much part of its power. And that skill in the art of visual composition is something that schools of art, of photography, can provide. And I've constantly suggested the importance of the force of narrative. Two very different novels that I think are among the best of fictionalizations of true facts relating to the environment. Ian McEwan's wonderful comic novel, Solar, which I'm actually having the pleasure of teaching in my class this week, um, a novel about a, uh, a, uh, a scientist uh, having a midlife crisis, um, but McEwan uses it to address climate change and also to address the possibilities of solar power and the possibilities of light as a new form of energy. And then recently published novel, uh, Richard Powers, who I think of all living American novelists is the one who's most closely engaged with all the sciences, but especially the environmental sciences. His extraordinary novel, um, The Overstory, it's a little too long when a writer um, becomes as successful and distinguished as Powers. Perhaps the editor doesn't use her blue pencil as much as she should. But nevertheless, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an extraordinary achievement. I, I reviewed it and I suggested that this is the book that does for trees what Moby Dick does for whales, but it's not about hunting them down, but it's about listening to them, partly based on that extraordinary non-fiction book, narrative non-fiction book, The Secret Life of Trees, uh, which was published in Germany a couple of years ago. So much of it is about 
the, the recent discoveries of the amazing ways in which trees communicate with each other, the ways in which trees cooperate, in which they act as a community, send out warnings to each other about parasites and so forth. We hear so much about Darwinian ideas of competition. We need to hear more about the way that species and ecosystems are also sustained through cooperation. And the model suggested by that novel is that the, the cooperation, the community of trees, can perhaps be mirrored in a cooperation between people and trees. And of course, in many ways, that is a very ancient idea. Um, a piece of work that I'm just beginning on and really want to take further is thinking about some of the myths and stories about trees, the spirits of trees that exist in so many cultures around the world. I'm especially familiar with Ovid's Metamorphoses, the Western tradition, but there are such extraordinary tree stories in other traditions as well. And just to give you a little example of that, some years ago, I uh, curated uh, the show for the British Museum uh, when the Olympics were on in London. Uh, as the reason that London rather than, well, one of the main reasons that London rather than Paris won the bid for the 2012 Olympics was they said there would be a cultural festival alongside the Olympics. And at the center of that cultural festival, they put Shakespeare. So the Globe Theater uh, put on all Shakespeare's 38 plays, but in 38 different languages with companies coming from 38 different countries. And Neil McGregor, the director of the British Museum, asked me to curate or co-curate um, an exhibition about globalization in the age of Shakespeare. The idea being as the world came to London in 2012, so the exhibition would explore how London saw the world and how globalization began in 1612, in Shakespeare's time. And at the center of that exhibition, I put Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. And in the course of researching the exhibition, we, I brainstormed with the curators from all the different departments of the British Museum. And I spoke about the, the figure of Ariel, who is a spirit imprisoned in a tree. And I said, we need to find an object to represent this. The, the, the British Museum is the great collection of material culture. So the idea was to find objects uh, that could be related to Shakespeare's words and images and characters and settings. And no sooner did I say that about Ariel than the curator of 16th century South American art said, a spirit imprisoned in a tree, I've got one of those. And was able to bring it forward and we included it in the exhibition and we were able to explore the tribal culture um, out of which that spirit came and compare it with Shakespeare's Ariel. Another key humanities discipline is of course history. And it seems to me that inspiration from history, the things that we can learn from the past, are a key aspect of what humanities can bring to the sustainability table. Um, so a particular shift, very welcome one, in much historical, recent historical writing has been the development of the field of environmental history. Over the past 40 or 50 years, it's been wonderful work recovering history from below, working people's history, the history of indigenous people, the history of excluded voices, the history of women especially. But just in the last decade or so, more and more historians have said, let's also recover the history of the environment. One particular history uh, that I think is, a, is an inspiring example is the history of the national parks movement. And that began with my great poet, my favorite poet, William Wordsworth, who in his book, A Guide to the Lakes, Guide to the Lake District of the North of England, this is Grasmere, Wordsworth's village, um, said that there was something so special about the Lake District that it should become, in his phrase, a sort of national property. A Scotsman named John Muir was um, a reader, a great reader of Wordsworth in his youth. And then, of course, he came to the States. He came to the west of the, of, of the States. And he was one of the key originators, both of the Sierra Club, but also of the national parks. Yellowstone was, of course, the first national park. John Muir didn't achieve the national parks alone. But his work in Yosemite and then the friendship he forged with Theodore Roosevelt was the thing that really 
allowed the national park movement to take off. Late in life, Muir returned to Britain, and one of the first things he did was he went to William Wordsworth's grave to pay homage to the spiritual father of the National Park Movement. And of course, Muir's other great inspiration was Henry David Thoreau. I wish to speak a word for nature, for absolute freedom and wildness, as contrasted with a freedom and culture merely civil. To regard man as an inhabitant or a part and parcel of nature, rather than a member of society. I wish to make an extreme statement, if so I may make an emphatic one, for there are enough champions of civilization, the minister and the school committee, and every one of you will take care of that. The West of which I speak is but another name for the wild, and what I have been preparing to say is that in wildness is the preservation of the world. Every tree sends its fibers forth in search of the wild. There is, of course, a long and complex narrative of the westward shift of America, and that has its dark aspect. But there is no doubt that Thoreau's inspiration was a direct source for the work that Muir and others did in establishing the national parks. Um, I recently had the pleasure of watching the great Ken Burns um, PBS series of films describing the national parks as America's best idea. Going back to the power of images, it is of course Ansel Adams's images of the national parks that have in many ways shaped how we think about the West, how we think about wildness, about wilderness, and about preservation. Uh, Adams himself in a university commencement address said this, to man's technical ingenuity, almost everything is possible. To control the probabilities will require another ingenuity, a fresh attitude to and respect for the land. The reclamationists and the developers speak of the conservationists' unreality, not realizing there are other realities, other objectives, other accomplishments in the life of man than the poorly modulated technological and economic achievements of our nervous time. I show you there one of Ansel Adams' iconic images from the Joshua Tree National Park. I show you also iconic Joshua Trees cut down during government shut down just last month. There are also tales of human waste. A.R. Ammons, one of the great American poets of the late 20th century in his extraordinary long poem, Garbage, writes, we need nothing more except the spelling out of these for those inattentive or too busily lost in the daily elaborations to prize the essential. One, don't complain. Ills are sufficiently clear without reiterated description. Two, count your blessings, spelling them over and over into sharp contemplation. Three, do what you can, take action. Four, move on keep the mind allied with the figurations of ongoing. I would suggest that our national parks, your national parks, are one of the ways in which we can prize the essential, but sometimes one does have to take action in order to preserve them. But history provides us not only with inspiration, but also with critique. One of the roles of the academy is to question received wisdom. National parks, America's best idea. Yes, but they've worked by and large in America, but they don't work everywhere. In a very fine essay called Rethinking American Exceptionalism Toward a Transnational History of National Parks, Wilderness and Protected Areas, the environmental historian J.M. Turner points out that the exporting of the American national park model to other countries, India, for example, is not always a good thing. This dualism between American cultural chauvinism, the national parks are America's best idea, and anti-imperial criticism, protected areas have been a form of imperial enclosure that romanticize nature and 
alienates local people worldwide, has been central to the literature on parks, wilderness, and protected areas since the 1990s. But both sides in this debate have often shared one key assumption, that a coherent model of the American National Park, predicated on wilderness protection, has been the definitive model for nature protection globally. But consider these figures. As of 2010, only 8% of protected area by number and 47% of protected land by area falls into categories of land protection and management that are national parks or wilderness areas, meaning most protected areas are otherwise classified and managed. Many of the alternative categories of protected areas aim to support local communities, sustainable resource use, and cultural values. And in recent decades, it is these protected area categories that have been growing most rapidly. This is not to say that an American model of national parks has not been influential historically, but to suggest there is considerable and underappreciated diversity in the history of protected areas worldwide, which historians have only recently begun to explore. And Turner does explore international models, as I say, particularly in, um, in Asia and Africa, very interestingly, although rather bizarrely, he has nothing to say about the English national parks, which are fascinatingly different from the American ones because they are not protected areas in the sense of areas where people do not live and work and build. They are living areas, but with very strong planning regulations. It's a very different model. So communication of various kinds. Second, imagination. And here I'm going to think mainly about the visual, about the art of sustainability. Falling water, perhaps the most iconic building in America from the point of view of the integration of a building with its landscape. Frank Lloyd Wright's essential idea of what he called organic architecture, the idea that a building must belong to its locality. I was completely bowled over by my visit to Taliesin West last week. The sense of those stones being taken from the mountain so the building looks as if it emerges from the mountain. The sense, too, that it wasn't originally a building that was enclosed. The, the glass that you can see there ha has only been put in since it became a, a museum. Frank Lloyd Wright believed in the building being open to the environment, being at one with the environment. The ideal of an organic architecture, he wrote, is a sentient, rational building that would owe its style to the integrity with which it was individually fashioned to serve its particular purpose, a thinking as well as feeling process. And that sense of a, an interdependence of thinking and feeling seems to me, again, crucially, what the humanities can bring to sustainability. Scientists are encouraged to think and not to feel. Right is surely right that we need to think and to feel. I believe in God, he said, only I spell it N-A-T-U-R-E. Study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. And of course, in developing his ideas, he looked not only to his own traditions, but also to Eastern traditions. Inscribed on a stone at the back of the theater that he built at Taliesin West, a quote from Lao Tse, the reality of the building does not consist in the roof and walls, but in the space within to be lived. That notion of dwelling of a lived space. It seems to me the sustainable architecture of the future will depend on that. I think it is in the visual arts that some of the most extraordinary um, interventions in our thinking about the environment have taken place. In Britain, the land art of Andy Goldsworthy, the walking art of Richard Long have had enormous influence. And here in the West, of course, we have the pioneering art of Robert Smithson, the extraordinary spiral jetty in the Great Salt Lake, a work of art that appears and disappears as water levels rise and fall. 
And of course, with the drought of recent years, it has been all fall. Art, too, is a way of making us think with wonder about science. Just across campus, outside the building I gave my first lecture in, James Turrell's um, extraordinary installation, which lights up at dawn and dusk, a way of thinking about light. And, of course, multiplying it by many times in scale and many millions of dollars in cost, uh, the astonishing uh, work of art that is Roden Crater, a way of bringing together art and science, of thinking about how we live in light and how light behaves. More traditional kind of art, um, of course, is the art of landscape. It was Oscar Wilde who famously said that uh, the, there weren't any, there wasn't any fog in London until Monet came along and started painting it. Well, of course, that's that's not true. The reason that there was smog in London in the 19th century, as Dickens knew well, was because of industrial pollution. But what Oscar Wilde was getting at there was that the way in which we look at the world is shaped by our artists. Once the Impressionists came along, also because, of course, photography had come along, a certain kind of realistic landscape painting was no longer possible. And of course, it's after that change, the growth from Impressionism through into Modernism, that Georgie O'Keeffe comes west. This is one of her um, images uh, near, near Taos. But the way that O'Keeffe thinks about nature and its objects, but also constantly thinks in relation to her own body, to the embodiment of the human, that seems to me a story that can be retold environmentally with a powerful sustainability message. Georgia O'Keeffe wrote, when you take a flower in your hand and really look at it, it's your world for the moment. I want to give that world to someone else. She is perhaps echoing William Blake to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. The work of art can give a flower, a place, a grain of sand, infinity, eternity, to the spectator, to the reader. It can conserve, preserve, and in so doing, art can be a form of self-care, as well as a form of planetary care. But I'd like to suggest that it is not only representational art that does this. This is Agnes Martin's uh, extraordinary painting, White Flower. It doesn't look much like a white flower. So what's going on here? It seems to me Agnes Martin is one of the very, very greatest artists of the 20th century. Abstract Expressionism seems to me to reach its apex in her work. She was born in Canada, but of course she came down to the Southwest and found her spiritual home here, just as Georgia O'Keeffe did. Now how, you will ask, does an image like this, this is her, her summer, one of her famous grid paintings, how does an image like that represent nature, represent summer? I think the way that it does it is by stripping back to elementals, line and color, and by simultaneously creating a sense of wonder, a sense of beauty, but also implicitly recognizing our detachment from nature, recognizing that we have symbolic language, whether that is the language of visual images hitting the retina or the language work through which we communicate. We are in that sense different from our environment. 
and yet somehow art can reconnect us to it and in so doing reconnect us to our essential selves this is what she wrote uh, these are notes from her lecture on the perfection underlying life uh, which I, I think one of the best accounts of um, her, certainly of her work and indeed perhaps of what many artists would feel they achieve I would like to consider further those moments in which we feel joy in living to some these moments are very clear and to others of a vagueness that can only be described as below the level of consciousness. Whether conscious or unconscious, they do their work, and they are the incentive to life. A stockpile of these moments gives us an awareness of perfection in our minds, and this awareness of perfection in our minds makes all the difference in what we do. Moments of perfection are indescribable, but a few things can be said about them. At such times, we are suddenly very happy, and we wonder why life ever seemed troublesome. In an instant, we can see the road ahead free from all difficulties, and we think that we will never lose it again. All this and a great deal more, in barely a moment, and then it's gone. But all such moments are stored in the mind. They are called sensibility or awareness of perfection in the mind. We must surrender the idea that this perfection that we see in the mind or before our, our eyes is obtainable or attainable. It is really far from us. We are no more capable of having it than the infant that tries to eat it. But our happiness lies in our moments of awareness of it. The function of artwork is the stimulation of sensibilities, the renewal of memories of moments of perfection. There's a lot of gloom and darkness out there at the moment about the future of our planet, our species, our communities. There was a lot of darkness in my second lecture, but I hold to this notion of the moment of perfection that can be achieved in the work of art as something that we should be very hopeful about, that will always be there. talked about Rachel Carson and the origins of the modern environmental movement. Another of the origins was, of course, the publication of that book, The Limits of Growth, the recognition towards the end of the 1960s that economic growth cannot go on sustainably without limit. How can the humanities contribute to the need for limitation? I would suggest that that is where our philosophers can help us. This old chap is Epicurus, uh, the philosopher who, unlike Plato with his indoor academy, the philosopher who set up his academy in a garden and who argued that there's no such thing as eternal life. There are no such things as transcendent gods. What we must do as human beings is accept limits and the best things we can do is commit ourselves to friendship and to gardening. The garden for Epicurus and a long tradition of subsequent writers um, is an image of the perfect integration of cultivation and nature, of the human and the natural held in balance, in ecological harmony. Um, Epicurus, for a long time, of course, was disapproved of because of his atheism, but he was rediscovered in the 17th century in England. Um, and I've just put some quotes there from uh, a, a number of great 17th century writers, Sir William Temple, who actually wrote a treatise on the gardens of Epicurus, the poets Abraham Cowley, Andrew Marvel, um, and um, the, the, the writers Sir Thomas Brown and, and John Evelyn, uh, extraordinary figure in the history of the environmental movement. Uh, uh, he, he wrote the first treatise on forest preservation, um, all seeing in the garden uh, an image of, uh, of, of, of hope, of harmony. I think in the area of limitation, Religion has a key part to play. Our theology departments really need to come to the fore at this point, the study of religion. I spoke a little in the first lecture about that argument that, uh, that, that's been around for a while that the, 
the theological emphasis on a transcendent God, on all that matters is preparing our souls for heaven, the idea that humankind has mastery and dominion of the earth, that in some ways these are part of the ecological problem. But I suggested there's a counter tradition within Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, emphasizing our stewardship of the earth. And I spoke of the current pope, uh, who of course took his name from St. Francis, of all the saints, the one who showed most respect for, for the non-human, for animal life and so forth, for flowers too. Um, and how in his en encyclical Laudato Si, the Pope really kind of wrestled with the question of sustainability um, and found a theology behind it. I did say, however, that there was one flaw in that rather extraordinary document. And of course, the thing that is the flaw in the document is that in the course of that 250 pages or so, he says nothing about contraception. And limitation surely requires contraception. We need a change in the Catholic Church in that regard. But I think that religious traditions, not least that religious tradition of asceticism, of mysticism, the monastic tradition, these are ancient images of a sustainable way of living. So I see hope in a strand of Christianity. But of course, over a billion people in the planet are Muslims. And I think many Islamic scholars would suggest that it's more of a struggle to create a kind of Islamic eco-theology than is the case with the Christian eco-theology that has been emerging in the last 10 or 20 years. Nevertheless, there are some signs of hope. Soon after the Pope's encyclical, a number of Islamic scholars uh, jointly produced an Islamic declaration on global climate change. Um, and found uh, in the Quranic uh, ethic of the knowledge of creation, found a kind of model for sustainable Islam. But what was noticeable was how few of those scholars came from the petrochemical nations of Islam, Saudi Arabia in particular. That is a huge problem that I think Islamic theologians are going to have to address. Hinduism, of course, uh, is much more uh, readily seen as a sustainable religion. Um, we know that methane from livestock is as much of a problem as carbon emissions from aeroplanes, cars, from in industry. In Hinduism, of course, the cow is sacred. Yes, there are cows used for dairy, but the great bulk of the sustainability problem uh, with cows is, of course, beef. And in Hinduism, and again, that's another billion people, uh, beef is proscribed. So Hinduism, the sacred cow, perhaps gives us hope. The question of how much the West can learn from the East is, I think, a crucial and interesting and a complex one. There are many respects in which Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Japanese Shinto seem to be religions much more accommodating to an idea of sustainability and ecological balance than the monotheistic religions of the West are. There is, however, uh, an anxiety that, that, that one has, perhaps an anxiety that we've learnt from cultural commentators such as Edward Said in his Orientalism. The West, is the Western reception of Hinduism and Buddhism of those ideas? Is it a case of submission to an ancient wisdom or is it a case of cultural appropriation? That seems to me a question that needs to be debated within schools of humanities. A couple of quotes here to, to illustrate it. On the left, a passage from the preface to the first English translation of the Bhagavad Gita, the great foundational text, part of the Mahabharata, the great foundational text um, of the, the, the Hindu tradition, um, where 
the introducer speaks of the Brahmins enjoined to perform a kind of spiritual discipline not unknown to the religious orders of Christians in the Romish church. This consists of devoting a certain period of time to the contemplation of the deity, his attributes, and the moral duties of this life. It is required of those who practice this exercise, not only that they divest their minds of all sensual desire, but that their attention be abstracted from every external object and absorbed with every sense in the prescribed subject of their meditation. In an act of meditation, one is not a consumer. Every moment that every person spends in meditation is a moment that they are not spending on carbon emissions. Seems like a good idea, but who wrote that? Warren Hastings, Governor General of India. Hastings, of course, um, was fascinated by the traditions of the East, but one of the reasons he wanted to know about them was to help the British keep in control of them. Opposite it, I put a quote uh, from uh, the Charles Wilkins 78, that, this, this translation that Warren Hastings uh, introduced of, of the Bhagavad Gita, where he says this, um, he who may behold, as it were, inaction in action and action in inaction is wise among mankind. He is a perfect performer of all duty. It seems to me this is one of the great dilemmas facing everybody who wants to live sustainably. One way to live sustainably is through inaction, through an ascetic life, a simple life, a life of minimal consumption. But that is a form of inaction analogous to Epicurus's withdrawal into his garden. Action is also needed to create change. But maybe there is some profound wisdom here in the Bhagavad Gita in the idea of finding inaction in action and action in inaction. I suspect that was a real eureka moment for Henry David Thoreau, who read deeply in Eastern texts, the Bhagavad Gita in particular. So we find him saying in Walden, in the morning I bathe my intellect in this stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. And he, he speaks of it being so ancient that our modern literature seems puny and trivial. And he concludes, the pure Walden water is mingled with the sacred water of the Ganges. I began my series with a quote from Thoreau. And of course, he is the exemplary American thinker of deliberation, slowing down, being thoughtful. Here he is in Walden Woods. You will know the passage, but we can read it again and again and again. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swathe and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. The humanities over recent years have become good at theory. We need a theoretical framework for these ideas that I've been exploring in a very disparate way as I've ranged across cultures, across generations, across art forms, and across disciplines. And I would suggest one possible framework comes from the Frankfurt School, that school of thinkers that gave us Adorno and Horkheimer and Benjamin. But one of the, I think, unduly neglected figures in the Frankfurt School was the psychoanalyst Eric Fromm, who in a summation of his work wrote a book called To Have or To Be, in which he suggested that there are two modes of existence for human beings. The having mode, which he associates with the acquisitive society, with the desire to have, and 
the being mode, which he associates with notions of being passive as well as active, the will to give, to share, to sacrifice. And he suggests that being can bring security and solidarity, whereas having brings insecurity and antagonism. As I try to develop the thoughts of these three lectures uh, into what I hope will be a kind of short but, but grounded uh, po polemical book, I think that from to have and to be this opposition of having and being may become my theoretical framework. I've also tried to suggest throughout all these lectures that sustainability is a matter not only of protecting the, the biodiversity of the planet, but also of an understanding of the diversity of human cultures and a meeting place of cultures. My notion of artwork as a form of deliberation depends, I think, not only on how I would read Thoreau, but also how I would read the magnificent centuries-long enduring tradition of the poetry of the Tang Dynasty in China over a thousand years ago. An anthology of 300 poems from the Tang Dynasty was put together in the 18th century and remains uh, a book that is in almost every home in China. Li Po, Wang Wei, those other great poets of ancient China had a way of retreating from the competition and anxiety of the dynastic court, retreating to the mountain or the woods or the river or the lake, of contemplating the moon, the bamboo grove, as a way of finding themselves, finding an inner calm, reconnecting with the earth. It's an Eastern tradition, but it's one that has also been inspirational in the West. Early in the 20th century, Gustav Mahler wrote his great orchestral song cycle, Das Lieder von der Erde, the Song of the Earth. And his texts were based on translations from these Tang poems. The final one, Der Abschied, the Farewell, stitches together a number of the poems of Wang Wei, um, who, who I, I think is a, 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 the, the greatest of all these poets. Um, it ends like this. Um, I'm going to read it, and then if the sound is working, uh, you're going to hear Dame Janet Baker singing the last bit of it for about two minutes. But, uh, but I'm, my, my grand theatrical climax, even though we're in a theatre, has been slightly spoiled by the fact that I'm not sure that the sound is going to work, because I had a little overture from Das Lied von der Erde, and the, there wasn't any sound for it. But allow me to, to, to read it, and then I'll click the thing and see uh, if you hear some sound, which w will be, as I say, the farewell. Uh, although I hope not a final farewell from me. Um, but if you don't, uh, if nothing happens when you click, you can, you can give me some applause instead. <laughs> Where do I go? I go, I wander in the mountains. I seek peace for my lonely heart. I wander homeward to my abode. I'll never wander far. Still is my heart awaiting its hour. The dear earth everywhere blossoms in spring and grows green and new everywhere and forever blue is the horizon forever forever yeah, that would sound. <laughs> Do you mean my culture and Britain and your culture here? Yeah. So, um, well, I, th I think what you, I, I, I actually, I was in Los Angeles um, uh, in, in, in December uh, before coming here. Um, and the first time I'd been back there for quite a long time, I, I, I worked for a while at UCLA back in, in, in the 1990s. Uh, and the, the famous Los Angeles smog was absolutely terrible. Uh, it is extraordinary uh, how much better. 
the, the, the atmosphere now is um, in Los Angeles because of hybrid cars. Um, so it, it, it seems to me hybrid and electric vehicles are, are something that you here are doing much better than we are doing in Britain. We've been very, very slow on that front in Britain. Um, I think we are, um, we are doing better around sustainable architecture. Um, the, uh, the, the standards of I mean, insulation, for example, uh, are, um, are now very, very, very good indeed. And there's a, uh, I mean, I, I got quite interested in this because um, one of the projects I've been involved with at the, the college that, that, that I lead was some um, building a, a, a wonderful kind of lecture theatre and um, uh, conference centre. Um, and we've used for that ground source heat pump. Uh, and, so, uh, uh, and photovoltaic panels as well. And um, I think there's a lot of very ingenious, sustainable architecture. It's quite interesting, actually, the, how my building was, came second for the, the Sterling Prize uh, last year, which is the, uh, the big European architectural prize. The building that won it uh, was the Bloomberg building, uh, uh, which is a, a, a quite extraordinary new 1.5 billion pound building. Uh, in the city of London, that's become um, Blue, Bloomberg's headquarters for Europe. Um, cynical people said the judges only uh, selected the Bloomberg building because they needed to show that London is open for business at the time of Brexit. But speaking to the judges, uh, they, they were saying that the, um, the, the sustainability elements were an, an, an absolutely major factor um, in, in, in their decision. So I think, I think we're doing quite well with sustainable architecture. I think you're doing, doing better. Um, with, uh, with, with, with hybrid and, and electric cars. Um, I think in the, the cultural realm, um, the, my, my sense is that because British culture um, is in a sense more unified, um, you know, we're a small country, uh, public funding for culture and the arts is very, is, is very centralised and very London centric. And the kind of uh, the kind of the, the the buzz, the word, the conversation around the arts and culture is very much dominated by the BBC and the broadsheet newspapers. One thing that, that means is that uh, in in terms of uh, books, exhibitions, events that link the arts and humanities to the crisis of climate change. Um, there's much, much more visibility to, to that than I sense there is in the States at the moment. Well, I, th I think there are, there, are, you know, there are very interesting interventions going on, but the fragmented nature of uh, American cultural life means they don't perhaps have, have so much visibility. So that's just a few thoughts, but thank, thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, I think one uh, proper distillation of the role of of uh, professionals in the humanities in light of climate change is that we're supposed to be the, the greed uh, mouthpieces of, I mean, uh, propaganda, it sounds like. So, and the, the two pictures that were presented of a polar bear on the on the ice uh, bird, yep. and the, uh, the another, another example sign was the Apollo yeah. photograph. So, in the, the scientists behind uh, pausing that these polar bears were, were drowning in the Arctic. He came under investigation for fudging data, and that photograph isn't really evidence of drowning polar bears one way or the other. There's a lot of strong evidence that the Apollo 11 program is also quite uh, fraudulent altogether. So in, in consideration of this, we can't be, as people in humanities, we don't have the uh, we don't have the expertise, we're not equipped to discern whether or not the claims being made by these allegedly scientific organizations are true or false. Do you take, is it, do you see any reason to take any moral inventory of the fact that we as people in the humanities should become the propaganda pieces for these, for these propositions without being equipped to not verify them one way or the other? I, th I think I'm going to disagree with you um, because it seems to me, I talked a bit, a bit when I was talking about the idea of history, uh, the notion of inspiration from history, but also critique from history. And it, it, it does seem to me that uh, some, of, some of the key skills 
taught by the humanities are skills of the, the discrimination between the true and the false. That we are actually uh, taught to assess evidence. We do that when we go into an archive. Uh, I mean, I'm, some, I'm quite often asked um, to, uh, you know, some, somebody comes up with a, you know, an alleged new portrait of Shakespeare, uh, and I'm asked whether it's a fake or not. And you know, the the the, the, the assessment of evidence is something that I think the humanities are, are very, very good at. Now, I, I take your point that um, a particular photograph, such as that one of the polar bear, um, in a sense, a, a photograph is never objective. I mean, again, this is something that we, uh, we, we learn and we teach in the humanities. You know? A photograph, a film, um, a piece of writing has a point of view, and it is edited, and there's always the possibility that there's something just outside the shot that, 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 that questions it. Um, but the point about that, that image is that the, the power of images to work on our emotions is such that they capture the imagination and crystallize the debate and engage the spectator. <coughs> there's then a kind of second order question of uh, the, you know, the hard assessment of the evidence, and that's where it seemed. That's where it seems to me that when I was talking about the, the need for good journalism, good investigative journalism, where, the, where that comes in. Um, the other thing I, I want to add, just coming from my own particular expertise, is I think something that the humanities have long been very, very good at is seeing through ridiculous conspiracy theories. I spend an awful lot of time as a Shakespearean going around the world, finding myself sitting in a taxi or an Uber, and the driver says, so what do you do then? I say, I'm a Shakespeare scholar, among other things, and then they immediately say, oh, is it true that you really wrote those plays? Or I've kind of heard maybe Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. And it is the case that for 100 years, only 100 years notice, not 400 years since Shakespeare was actually around and writing, people have said, oh, maybe Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. It's a classic example of conspiracy theory. Um, and one of the things that humanistic scholarship is really good at, and that is a really important thing for us to do, is to put forward the evidence and prick the bubble of conspiracy theory. Um, I, I got into trouble in a, in a debate about this when I, I said in all seriousness that if you deny the truth of Shakespeare's authorship of his plays in one, at one moment, at the next, you might find yourself denying the reality of the Holocaust. There are Holocaust deniers out there. There's actually one particularly notorious Shakespeare denier who's also a Holocaust denier. Um, now, of course, these, whether a man from Stratford-upon-Avon wrote a bunch of quite good plays, and whether six million Jews died in gas, in gas chambers, is, uh, are questions of a completely different moral order. But the similarity comes in the fact that the the ability to use evidence, to assess hard, firm, truthful evidence, is a skill that humanists have. And it can be applied to Shakespeare deniers, Holocaust deniers, climate change deniers. And I, I'm pretty unrelenting in, in believing that. Let's take one more question, shall we? Yeah. You use tragedy of the commons in your yeah. Um, I've been talking about it in the class that I'm co-teaching with uh, Professor Lucia because it's a, uh, again, it's, it's, a, it, it's a really important argument. Um, and it's, it's, it's one that I'm particularly interested in because um, of my, my work on the poet John Clare. Um, John Clare, uh, a little bit younger than Wordsworth, contemporary of, uh, of, John, of John Keats, of Lord Byron, well, uh, probably the greatest nature poet uh, in the English language. Um, but he was a, an impoverished agricultural labourer um, who lived through the enclosure of the commons uh, in his district of Eastern England. As, as you know, enclosure of the common land was a very long history. I mean, some of it began back in medieval times. Uh, but his part of Eastern England, East Anglia, uh, the enclosure came later. He, he actually worked as a, as a, as a labourer, putting up fences, diverting streets during the enclosure. And he wrote with extraordinary power about the way 
in which the end of the commons affected both the ecosystems, how it affected the flowers, the trees, the birds, the water in the streams, and how it affected the community and their traditions and, and, and their rituals. Um, and the, there are, you know, there are interesting and complicated arguments about um, the, the, uh, the old idea of the commons then being overgrazed, overused, and that itself leading to environmental degradation, as against the idea that it's with you know, a new rentier, rentier class of, of landowners coming in and changing the land. And th those debates are really, really, really important. What, what interests me as a kind of historically minded person is there is a very long history to them, and there is a history of protest coming from writers in responding to them. But yeah, it's, it's an argument that definitely needs to, to, to be part of the story. Was there just one more at the front? Okay, thank you. One thing uh, you haven't talked about today, I think you did a bit earlier, is uh, the views of indigenous people in North America. Mm. And I think we have a lot to learn from that. Well, absolutely, yeah. And uh, yeah. I was just wondering what your feeling was. Yes. Uh, my, my feeling is this is exactly the topic uh, that Jeffrey uh, alluded to uh, in his introduction. Um, the, to me, one of the fascinations of, uh, of of, of, of the Southwest um, is precisely that it, it, it is a kind of meeting place um, of indigenous traditions and of um, Western white notions of preservation. Um, again, in, in the class um, that, that I, I, I've been co-teaching here, we've been looking at Edward Abbey's book, uh, Desert Solitaire, uh, where on the one hand, there's a, there's a very powerful kind of John Muir influenced um, argument about uh, the beauty, the importance, the sacredness of the national parks, it's the arches in his case, uh, and there's a kind of there's a rant against the motor car and so on. Um, and, but then in terms of his relationship with the indigenous people, there's a, there's a really sort of complex sense of, on the one hand, deferring to learning from learning uh, of their history their, and respecting their traditions. But there is also uh, a, a, a kind of um, or unconscious and sometimes even semi-conscious racism that, that, is, that is typical of, of, of Abby's generation. So it, seem, it seems to me that here in the Southwest is actually a place where that dialogue can take place very fruitfully. And I know that Jeffrey's plan uh, for a big research project within the humanities uh, uh, school here um, is around the desert. Uh, I talked a lot in the second lecture about the image of the flood, and you know we think of um, the coastal cities that are going to flood if uh, if things go badly. Uh, but of course, the the flip side of uh, of, 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 of climate change is, is desertification. But as Jeffrey said in his introduction, there is much to learn from indigenous people who have managed to inhabit the desert in a sustainable way. Uh, that's a dialogue I'm just, I'm just beginning to learn about. Um, I think the difficulty for me, and, and this is what I was slightly trying to allude to uh, when I put up that slide saying East meets West, ancient wisdom or cultural appropriation, is that we, I think we need I need to avoid being Warren Hastings. <laughs> All right, John, thank you so much.